Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graven. Our guest today is Ken Snyder. He is the executive director of the Shingo Institute and a senior lecturer at Utah State University. So Ken's been the executive director of the Institute since 2015. Uh, earlier in, in his life and career, he developed an interest in Japanese business practices while living in Japan while he was a student. This led him to major in Japanese history at the University of Utah, and he pursued an MBA from the Harvard Graduate School of Business with the intent of uh, working with a Japanese business that was expanding in the U.S. Uh, he joined the John M. Huntsman School of Business there at Utah State University in 2008, and previously, he was the president of Marketing Communications, Inc., an operating division of Taylor Corporation, where he directed a group of six companies and grew revenues from $25 million to over $80 million. So, um, Ken, thank you for, for joining us. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Mark. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And um, I, I, we have a lot to talk about. Um, for, for the audience, I've, I've known Ken for probably a, a decade Mm -hmm. I think since we first crossed paths and, and I'm learning and, and during our prep and I'm going to learn more during the episode of some of your prior business experience. So um, it'd be interesting to um, hear a little bit more of your history and, and your perspectives. I've got the scars to go with that business experience too. <laughs> okay. And I know your students and, and people involved with the Institute are um, getting to learn and, 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 and benefit from some of your experiences and scars. Well, I will talk about one of those because it wasn't until I came to the Institute that I realized the mistake I had made mm. or the solution anyway to the mistake I had made. Yeah. And and uh, it's one I had pondered for many years. So I'm looking forward to telling that story. Okay, well, good. So that's a good segue into um, the story and the lessons learned. And um, so I guess I'll go ahead and, and tee you up. You're already... Um, thinking about it, so I'll let you get right into it. And Ken, what what is your favorite mistake? My my favorite mistake mistake is maybe not the right word, but you'll you'll see it's 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 the the biggest thing I couldn't figure out at the time, but then later got finally understood what I should have done in the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, the the time the times I noticed it the most, I was president of a company called Progressive Impressions. It was one of the Taylor Corp companies. Later, I got promoted to be a group president, but but uh, this is kind of mid-career. The time period is the 1990s, roughly. Mm -hmm. And we were a leading database marketing company, and we did marketing, ser provided marketing services for distributed sales networks. So, for example, the agents of insurance companies and the dealers or the value-added retail dealers for large computer companies were those were some of our clients and because in in most cases there were a few cases where central had a centralized database to send the, the main company that would have this distributed sales force mm -hmm. but in most cases the databases were held by the dealers or the agents or whatever and so we would, if, when, and I'll just use the example of the computer company. They had 6,000 dealers around the world, and we were doing a dealer-oriented marketing piece that was customized to those dealers, but largely funded by corporate headquarters. So our contract was with corporate headquarters. Um, the dealers provided their data to us. And this wasn't. This was before the internet was used for data exchange. So we got, for example, with six thousand dealers, we got six thousand either tape, disc, huh. wow, cartridge, you name it, yeah. and and no consistency at all. And and once we landed a contract, the first thing that would happen would be uh, we would do this project onboarding pro uh, process or system, if you will. And we had a bunch of data jockeys who would then take those 6,000 things. But under So we'd, we'd assign a lead uh, data person who would then accumulate all the data, format it, put it in the right fields, get it all ready so that we could use it to, to customize the marketing pieces and have all the, the customer information where the, the uh, promotional piece was going to go. Mm -hmm. So what... What we discovered was that each of the data jockeys had their own way of doing things. Mm -hmm. You know, they're all experts. They're all smart. They all think their way is the best way. Mm -hmm. But it was everybody did it differently. Mm -hmm. And we thought, 
this is not good. We need to figure out the best way to do it. And so we got them all together and kind of forced a, what's the best way to do this step? What's the best way to do this step? What's the best? And went through step by step by step and had them all agree to it. We documented it, created this standard work document for onboarding data. Mm -hmm. And then I walk away thinking, we've made an improvement. Mm. Come to find out a couple months later, I'm sitting in a meeting and one of the data jockeys the, running the project we're onboarding new mentioned something that wasn't part of the standard work that mm. we talked about. Yeah. And I go, I thought we did it that way. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, I, mean, I don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. And so then I started to go back and look and see what the other guys were doing, too. And pretty much everybody had gone back to their original way of doing everything. Mm their own way so yeah. the standard work we created was no longer standard we were back to the old way which was every individual did it their own way well, well when you say went back to it sounds like it really never moved away from it that. never moved away okay. yeah it never so so I, I started thinking you know we did this big effort to try to standardize and make it better for everybody but each of them had this opinion that it sub-optimized their ideal way of doing things, mm -hmm. even though somebody else's ideal was very different than their ideal. And I won it got me thinking, why did we revert back? Why, or why, why was it never, never change? Or why, why did well, we why never, did we never change? change? Why did we never change? I thought we had decided that we were going to do it this, oh, this so, new way. So so how many of those 6,000 people had input with you in designing that new approach? You probably well, no, talked this, all 6,000. This, this is a group, this is a group of about 10 to 15 people. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's not this, we're getting people, we're getting data from 6,000 sources, but there's only 10 to 15 people who are trying to get them to okay. do this data onboarding the same way. Okay. So it's, but, but why didn't they, why didn't they adopt this, new way of doing it. Mm -hmm. This wasn't the only time I experienced thinking we had made an improvement mm -hmm. and not having that improvement stick. And I started noticing it more and more that, that it would go through some sort of Kaizen event. We would improve something and then I'd go back later and people are doing it the old way. And and kaizen for those who don't know is a Japanese word that would you would you agree it means basically uh, improvement or good improvement change? yeah we went through some sort of improvement activity and the improvement didn't stick so thank you Mark I should use the the English word <laughs> it's okay um, so I noticed this pattern a few more times and I I never could quite understand what it was about the improvement efforts that we had made and why they didn't stick when i thought everybody was bought in i thought everybody had agreed this is a better way for everybody and then you go back and you find out so i also noticed though that i always found out after i had seen it happening the old way after i thought we had decided on a new way that was a consistent pattern right and this one kind of stuck with me for a long time, okay? And I thought about it over, off and on over a course of many years. I, I get promoted. I then join the faculty of the university. And I'm still wondering, what was it that made it not stick? Mm -hmm. I never quite got it. Fast forward to, I think it was 2017. I am sitting in one of our shingle conferences listening to a presentation by Brent Allen, who was uh, an executive vice president for Lifetime Products. And we had invited Brent to, to give a presentation. He, he says, we've, we've been doing some interesting stuff with systems design. And I thought, oh, I'd like to see what they're doing. I know, they, you know they're experimenting in ways that would be interesting for me to learn about and see what, what it means for the Shingo Institute and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there and he goes, we found that we made oh, over the, we'd make lots of changes Mm -hmm. And then we'd go back and people had not really changed and they're doing it the old way or then mm -hmm. tried it for a few days and then gone back the old way, tried it for a few weeks, gone back the old way. Mm -hmm. He's talking exactly about this problem. I go, yeah, this is really interesting. And he says, what we found is the following things need to be in place in order for something to stick. He says, first of all, you've got to change the system. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought, okay, what do you mean by that? Brand? So I'm, I'm thinking, what do you mean by that brand? And he goes, you got to change the system. So it's easy for them to do it the new way mm -hmm. and hard for them to do it the old way. Right. You got to change the nature of the work. And then th that was the first thing he said. And I went, okay, I thought we kind of did address that. Not that that was part of the reason of making the change, but maybe we didn't make it hard. And then he said though, and this is the part that really caught it. He said, we found that we needed to do, and he used the word audit, and mm -hmm. we don't use that now in our systems design workshop that we have at the Shingo Institute, but mm -hmm. but we use the word feedback. There needs to be some sort of a feedback loop, some way to, to go check to see and make sure everybody's doing it the way mm -hmm. that you've now decided the new standard work will be done. Yeah. And it was like, that one kind of really hit home because in every case I could think of it, I found out about it either through a, a, a walking around and seeing or in a meeting and somebody says they're doing it. It was like, wait a minute, that's not what we decided how we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. I found out kind of accidentally afterwards, not purposefully finding, making sure it was be do being done the new way. Mm -hmm. But finding out accidentally by observing or but random random observation and or in a meeting or something yeah. like that. You get a report of yeah, yeah. somebody admits. Yeah. yeah. Somebody just just says they're gonna do it the, the way they're gonna do it. And wait a minute, that doesn't that doesn't fit with the way we decided we're gonna do it. So mm -hmm. it dawned on me that in every system change we made, for example, in this onboarding system. We, we may have documented the new way to do it, but we never built in any kind of a feedback loop mm -hmm. or an audit function, a way of ensuring that. And, and, and then he says, what we found, this is going back to what Brent said in his presentation. We found that at first, even when you make it, try to make it easy for people to do the right thing and hard for them to do the wrong thing, they, it's still easier for them to do it the old way. It's usually more comfortable. It's more comfortable and it's easier for them because they're used to it. Mm -hmm. And until they get used to this new way, there's a period of adjustment right. where you really need that feedback loop where this this is har harder than I thought it was going to be because, or I didn't know how to do this. So I went and did it my old, whatever. And without that feedback loop, mm -hmm. you don't get that information coming back to you. So you can say, how can we make it easier for you? Or what kind of training do you need to be able to make this work better? Yeah. And I just assumed we'd agreed on it. So it was done. Yeah. And and that was a mistake. <laughs> That's where really the mistake was, is in not thinking there needs to be some follow-up. There needs mm -hmm. to be some mm -hmm. follow-up. There needs to be some feedback loop. We need to go watch and observe to make sure it's being implemented. Yeah. And I'm sitting there in Brent's thing. I'm going, there was a, a real aha moment for me because this had bugged me for years. Yeah. And I get asked all the time at the Shingo Institute, we we just make improvements, but they don't stick. Right. You're not the only one making this mistake. <laughs> I've made that mistake. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I've, I, it's a question people ask all the time too, is why don't we, we make improvements, but they don't stick. Yeah. And to me, this was the thing that I was missing. Now, maybe something is missing in the way other people do improvements and the way they implement them. Mm -hmm. But, but what I found is it's a, it's really common that they're, mm -hmm. we don't make it easier. We make an improvement, but we make it hard for them to do the new way. And it's still easier for them to do the old way. Yeah. Or even if we make it easy for them there's something missing that makes it easy for them. And so like an obstacle, they don't have the trainer. They don't know how to do that. Oh, this is the procedure, but I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to do it the way I know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then there's the, you know, just the comfort that comes from doing it the way you mm -hmm. know how to do it the most. And you, you've got to have some sort of feedback as to, no, you can't do it that way or put up an obstacle to make it hard for them to do it the wrong way was something I'd never thought of before when Brent talked about yeah. that. And yeah. So it was, it was like, so many ahas in there about how can we make it stick, mm -hmm. but it all came down to designing the system the right way. Mm -hmm. You you got to, you got to design the work differently. You've got to put some sort of feedback or audit loop in there. Yeah. You've got to go and observe and verify you've, and, and you've got to document the, you know, if you've, there's things you figure out in that process, you got to document it. So everybody knows it and you can mm -hmm. share it with all the other 12, you know, 10 to 15 data jockeys who are supposed to be yeah. making the same improvement at the same yeah. time. Yeah. You've got to get them together and talk about the problems they're having as they do it too. And we yeah. didn't do any of that. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, there, there were things you did right, right? I mean, it, it's not mm -hmm. like you designed it and that it was a unilateral decision. Like you engaged people. Engaged people. And, but, and, and yeah, but, but it still didn't stick. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I think, I mean, there, there, there are times where people will nod their head and agree, but they, they might think, well, that makes Ken happy. Okay. I'll agree. <laughs> But I, I am sure do, there's I some of that going on too, Mark. Do it my way, and I'm not saying there's anything nefarious there, but no. I mean, it sounds like one of these situations, you know, these are tough to navigate. Where like there's a difference maybe between authority and influence. Like it sounds like you you were you you needed to influence um, rather than having authority of thou shalt do it this way or like you know that that sort of authority based way that some people try to drive change, which also you know, doesn't always work because people will find ways around um, that authority. Um, but but you 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 mentioned I, the 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 question I was going to ask was about you know the 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 word audit where I could see there are times where people think the word audit sounds very uh, kind of authority based. Yes. Like where, where now okay we're going to audit you and if you're not doing this way there are going to be consequences and eh, that's it becomes compliance. Working. Yeah. So yeah. so Brent used the word audit. They build an audit function into their systems in lifetime but but so so we when when Br we worked with this. We did more research in systems and and did a lot of you know I, I tried and Sean tried to read a whole bunch of systems books just to get up to speed on systems design, system components. We, you know, Deming wrote a lot about systems, but he never really clarified what are the elements you have to have in a system. And, and you know, there's a lot of confusion about it. But we eventually did that research effort and and put it together into a systems design workshop that we we launched. And in, in the process. Brent had retired from Lifetime, and we brought him in as a faculty fellow for the Shingo mm. Institute. Mm -hmm. And he helped us. He he joined our group uh, on a regular basis and and helped us design the system design workshop. And in in the course of the discussion about the term audit, we decided that's not the right mm -hmm. kind of connotation to use. It, right. it does it does imply compliance, mm -hmm. not not feedback. And so we said. You know, what we need is a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. Yeah. That's the word we use in the in the workshop now is mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be an audit, but but that's the word that, that they used at Lifetime at the time. Yeah. Um, but it was the I can I use the word today just to give you an idea of somebody's got to go check on it though. Sure, I agree, I agree there. Yeah. Okay, and, so yeah. so what we decided in as we talk about what's what's ideal state is the leader, the person who leads the system. So in the case of it should be the IT manager who looks over in our the case of our system. The ideal of what we should have done was the IT manager regularly goes and checks to make sure that the people are following the standard work. And if there's if there's people who are having difficult time following the standard work, get them together and say, what's the problem here? Right. And how can we fix it? How can we make it easier for you to do it this new way that, that will keep it standard between everybody? That's the kind of feedback loop we didn't have in mm -hmm. the system. Right. But if we when you make it what what I learned is when you make a significant change like this and, and you standardize everything across a group of people that there's going to be some hiccups and you've got to have right. a way of addressing those hiccups yes. on a timely basis. And then, you know, ironing out those issues. So it's easy for everybody to do it the okay. new way, yeah. which is we've all agreed would be a better way if it actually worked, but I, they're, they're having struggle, having the struggle, making it work. And then they just give up with because of that struggle and they drop back. And yeah. you've got to be able to address that in real time. You, you've got to help help people through the learning curve and the yes. discomfort. And yes. you know, doing something a new way might be at first less efficient. Yes. Until people power through the learning curve. And there's yes. all kinds of business dynamics where I'm not saying this applied to your situation, but I think of similar situations where um, you know, people are um, sort of being forced to adopt a new way, and then they're being punished for that short-term inefficiency through performance measures or incentives. Or you could say, "Well, that's that's unfair." Like a a, a constructive feedback loop yep. would, would maybe 
help leaders say, okay, we 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 need to give some allowance for this learning curve yes. and working our way through the change curve to the mm-hmm. new efficiency instead of giving up and saying, oh, this is slower. It didn't work. Well, maybe we just haven't gotten through the change yet. Right. And that's and that's exactly what we were missing was that follow through, if you yeah. will. Yeah. So um and, and and that idea of a feedback loop, and you know, it's not just the word, but I think the mindset and the principles behind it. You know, I think of one of the best leaders I've worked with in healthcare, uh, Jim, who was the director of the lab at Children's Hospital, Children's Medical Center in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Um, who would, he would use language, he would, he would talk about getting that feedback. And we were working to introduce standardized work and improve processes into his hospital laboratory. He was a, a student of Peter Senge and systems mm-hmm. thinking. And he was, he was a, a really thoughtful leader who really cared about his people. And, and he would talk about and sort of distinguish, you, you, I think use the word barriers. You know, Jim would talk about Make sure you really hear what he called legitimate barriers. And that sounds a little judgmental, but I think he was trying to separate the things that we need to address to be helpful versus, let's say, just the complaints of this is new, this is uncomfortable versus we need to tweak the standardized work and it'll be even better. Like he, he was sort of trying to separate and focus people toward like feedback that could help us improve as opposed to complaints. Yes. And and sometimes complaints are do give us as leaders insights uh-huh. into mm-hmm. where we you know let, let's look at the complaint. What's what's the reason behind the complaint? Sure. Usually there's a good reason behind the complaint. Yeah. And he wasn't trying to be dismissive. Right. Don't be dismissive. Yeah. Is that's the point I want to make. Is yeah. uh, there's a there's a reason somebody is having trouble with a certain issue, and they may want to. Ju- they may not have a solution. They do, but they do want to report. I got a problem here. Yeah. Well, and and part of that feedback loop. Um, well, boy, we we may need to ask why a number of yes. times. So if somebody just, I, I think if we dig into the quote unquote complaint. So if somebody if somebody says on some level, I don't like this new way. I don't want to do it. Well, instead of saying no, you have to like you you could dig and and well tell me more about that. Why 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 don't you like it? Is there you know? I mean, I think sometimes leaders don't dig beneath the surface to figure out then what is the legitimate concern. And I I found that the more, better trained people are, the better their ideas. Mm the more their complaints turn into suggestions on how to improve because yeah. now they have a, a way of looking at it with the training that they have of uh, this is a problem. It goes from this is a problem or I'd like to solve this problem this way. Yeah. And, you know, yes. give me the resources or give me the time or whatever to do it. And, and so I, I think a, a great way to bridge that is raise the skills of your people because then they can contribute in more valuable ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Ken, I, you know, I appreciate you sharing that story and your reflections and, and what you've learned and, and how the Shingo Institute helped you. I mean, I've attended many of the Shingo conferences and there, and there's always great speakers, you know, with, you know, in, insights and, um, new ideas and things that are really helpful. So, you know, tell the audience um, a little bit then about the Shingo Institute and, you know, in particular, I think connected to, you know, these topics of of mistakes and preventing mistakes and learning and improving the namesake <laughs> of the Shingo Institute. Tell, tell so, everyone about the, some of the history there. And that's, that, that's great. I'd love to do that. So uh, the Shingo Institute is a program within the Huntsman School of Business at Utah State. It's named after Shigeo Shingo, who was uh, one of the people who was a a father, if you will, of the Toyota production system. He never worked for Toyota, but he was hired by Toyota and worked for them as a consultant over the course of roughly 27 years. He taught a quarterly uh, P course, productivity course, Hmm. um, a week-long workshop of of lean systems and tools uh and and toyota would cycle about 30 people every quarter through shingles workshop and so over the course of those 27 years he taught about three to four thousand toyota leaders 
in this workshop. So he knows from that experience, he knew a lot of the Toyota people and he did a lot of outside work with Toyota as well. Um, he, in the course of working with Toyota and with other clients, he developed many of the terminologies that we have in the lean world today. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Pokeyoke is a Shingoism. He's the one who came up with the term, how do you error proof? Yeah. So you don't pass a, a mistake that's made down the line mm -hmm. to an, uh, the next step in the process. You error proof it so that you prevent that error from becoming a mistake right. and, a def and a defect, a defect if you will. Yeah. Um, he also developed the the thinking behind and the terminology that we use when we use the word SMED or mm -hmm. single minute exchange of dye, or more commonly, we now just use the term quick changeover. Mm -hmm. How do you get to where you can have a quick changeover so you don't shut down your production line or some other process that may be, you know, as you go through the change, everything gets disrupted. How do you make that changeover as short as possible and mm -hmm. keep the flow of the process uh, going as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Those are just, he also developed the concept of one piece flow. That's a, that he called it non stock production, mm -hmm. but non stock production and one piece flow are essentially the same thing. We we've renamed it a little bit from the way he described it, but he's the one right. who came up with the, the methodology, the thinking behind it, if you yeah. will, and wrote a book about it. Yeah. And and so he's he's just one of those pioneers that that was very influential, uh, both within Toyota but also in the broader world. He, over the course of his life, he wrote seventeen different books. I've got a the full uh -huh. set of them up here. Incidentally, yeah. the the this is the Shingo Library of books. If you okay. will, the original uh, Japanese, and the original then the Japanese, many of them yeah. first edition copies. Wow. Um, many of them with his notes for the second edition, incidentally. He oh. thinks that he wanted to change in the, for the second edition. He'd make in the first edition. Some Kaizen and, between the editions, yes. And and his his son, uh, Mitsuo Shingo, which I think you've probably met. I have. Um, yeah. Gave yeah. the full set of books to us from his father's library oh. uh, for the Institute to keep. And and. Uh, and I, I have the privilege of keeping it right behind my desk for easy access. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but you know, what a, a great leader and thinker in the, the world of Lean, a true pioneer, and we're honored to be named after him. Mm -hmm. In 1988, we invited Shigeo Shingo to come to our university. And, and uh, one of my predecessors, uh, Vern Bueller, had arranged for him to receive an honorary doctorate. And when he came for the ceremony and in, in that, that induction ceremony as a as a to become a doctor, if you will, um, he Vern Bueller and and uh, Norman Bodek, the three of them got together for dinner. And over dinner, they asked uh, Mr. Shingo if it was OK if we used his name to start a prize. Hmm. And and Shingo said, yes, it would be he would be honored. And he says, the, the the initial focus of the prize was to be on North American manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, you know, the, so the idea was to recognize manufacturers in North America for the great work they do in adopting your teachings and Toyota production system and, and that. And, and he said, the world needs American manufacturing to be strong. Mm. And if this, if having a prize will help that, then yes, please use my name to help make American manufacturing strong. Well, it's it's grown beyond manufacturing and it's grown beyond North America. It, it, we now have recipients in over 30 countries mm. of the Shingo Prize or Shingo Medallion. And it has spread to other industries as well. Uh, right now, I would say uh, about 20 to 30 percent of our recipients are North American manufacturers, and we have lots of other recipients in other parts of the world and lots of recipients in other industries besides manufacturing. It's become mm -hmm. a true global standard, yeah. which I think Shingo would be happy about. Yeah. I don't think he wanted us to limit our influence <laughs> yeah. to a certain geography and a certain industry. He wanted to, he would be happy with mm -hmm. how we're learning to apply those principles in other ways, in other yeah. industries, and in other countries. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this was happening at a time when, you know, Toyota, obviously with Japanese roots, was expanding with facilities, yes. not just North America, but but other countries. And and you know, I I one thing I admire about Toyota is their willingness to share and 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 help 
other companies and, and society. You know, Toyota has a, a group I, I know you're familiar with, Ken, TSSC, yes. that works with not just their own suppliers, but with hospitals and with nonprofits and um, companies in, in areas unrelated because they, they want to share their knowledge. And, you know, as I've heard from companies, I interviewed somebody on this podcast, Mike Kading, who runs um, a, a, a apartment, a company that designs and builds and rents apartments. Oh, they worked with TSSC. And as he described the process, you know, this is an opportunity for Toyota to learn from the process of helping another company. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm not surprised that Mr. Shingo, even with his indirect connection to Toyota, had that interest in sharing yes. and helping with others. Yes. And and it was it was wonderful. I I never met Shigo Shingo. He he passed away in early nineteen nineties and I wasn't involved with the Shingo Institute then. But I did get a chance to know his son very well. Unfortunately he passed away just a, a couple months ago. Right. But uh really wonderful man and and he he went to work for Toyota, worked for Toyota for 42 mm-hmm. years before uh, he hit mandatory retirement age yeah. and, and then started getting more involved with us and others that in our network around the world. And I, I know he's been a huge influence. And, you know, to, to us, he was kind of like a living brand, if you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, somebody who embodies all the things we're trying to teach, has all this experience of what we're trying to teach and and has the name to go along with it. So. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a fascinating turn how it was not just the family connection to his father, but the fact that he, he worked for Toyota and uh, ran Toyota's business in China. Yes. I mean, yeah, he was just... in China for 13 years mm-hmm. overall, and he ran actually three different aspects of their business in China over the course of that. He's the very first production plant, which made mini buses. Mm-hmm. And then they, he was put in charge of their next major investment, which was the Hino truck division, building a truck plant. Uh, and then he was in charge of the research center. Yeah. So he had a couple of different roles in China. And then he worked with the China office when he was in Japan for, that was part of what got him assigned to run the first startup there in the first in, in the yeah. first place. So yeah. lots of experience in China. Yeah. And, and I'm grateful. I, I, well, I likewise never got to meet Shigeo Shingo, but I did get to meet Ritsuo Shingo through attendance at Shingo conferences and our, our mutual friend, um, Norm Bodak, who has also sadly passed away in recent years, but um, the opportunity to, to, to not only hear him speak, but to, to talk informally with him and to mm-hmm. then have a connection. And I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, I think about two years ago, was able to have him as my guest on uh, the podcast I do about lean manufacturing. Oh, good. And good. and there's just a lot of, a lot of great stories and, and wisdom, you know, captured there, you know, so I'm very, very grateful for, for that. And um, all, 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 all the opportunities for learning and, and meeting great people that I've had personally through the Shingo Institute. Good. So a so public thank you. There's a, there's a little bit of, of the history of the Shingo Institute, the prize. Um, we've in the add a little bit to the history. Uh, we found that a lot of prize recipients weren't able to sustain excellence over time after there's receiving that challenge, the Shingo yeah. prize. Yeah, and then and I'm sure there's some people out there are going, yeah, us too, or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's hard to keep that that continuous improvement, you know, keep moving forward, but. We did some research in the early 2000s into why was that happening? Why were organizations getting to a shingle price level and then uh, deteriorating in their performance after that? And that's in 2008 published the, what we now call the shingle model. Hmm. Uh, we had a model before, an assessment model before that, that it consisted of systems, tools, and results. And and that's what kind of we thought people were able to sustain that, but it wasn't sustainable. Something was clearly missing. And, and when we dove into it and researched it, we, we figured out that we're missing some important pieces around behavior. Uh, the companies that kept getting better and better are the ones that had focused their from their focus changed their focus from results to behaviors. And I'll just give a quick example that one of the companies we visited, a shingle price recipient organization, they kept getting better and better with on safety. They were measuring how many safety catches there were. 
and how quickly they address those safety re, you know, reports and how quickly they resolve them so that nobody could ever get hurt that way. Yeah. And they were measuring that. And then they said to us, we don't have to worry about people getting hurt or losing time, you know, you know, time lost because of injury, because we don't have any injuries. And we know if we do the right the things up front, we can prevent those injuries from happening. So we don't have to worry about measuring injuries. We just worry about preventing them. Right. And that was a really impactful thing to us, that seeing that kind of action by many organizations, those preventive behaviors got us thinking about in the model, how can we create this behavior, this culture of preventive behaviors? And so when 2008, we published, well, the other thing that we found is those organizations could always answer the question, why? Mm -hmm. We'd ask them, why did you do this? And they would give us a very clear answer. And why did you do that? And we collected all those whys into what we call the guiding principles. We phrased mm -hmm. it in the form of a an action verb followed by a, an important topic, like yeah. respect as being the action verb, every individual. Because if you right. don't, then people won't feel included. They won't get engaged. Mm -hmm. But if they feel respect, now what does respect mean? And 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 we published the new model in 2008 and started assessing the shingle price to that at that point. And then a lot of people said, can you teach us what this means? And what do you mean by how do we do this preventive behavior? What are these guiding principles? How can we implement them in our organization? And that's where we started developing the workshops then. So we've yeah. been doing the workshops now for about 17 years mm -hmm. uh, when we published the new model. And it's been, we think, a, a very powerful impact, had a very powerful impact on yeah. the community and helping raise you know everybody together. So that's an yeah. important part of our history. I don't want to skip well, over either. And and, and and not just history, but the current day and the yeah current day the current future. Day. Um, uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. You know, I'll encourage people um, to visit the Shingo Institute website to learn about the workshops, the model, the guiding principles is all laid out there. But you know, before we wrap up, Tanya, I'm looking at this list of the guiding principles. And many of these, I think, are connected to core themes of the My Favorite Mistake podcast. Yes. <laughs> mentioned already, respect every individual. Um, realizing, for example, I mean, look, we're all human. We all make mistakes. That's part of our human nature, I think, to be respected. Um, leading with humility. Guests who come on here, yourself included, who have the humility to admit a mistake and the the, the, the strength to admit that mistake and to focus on another principle, seeking perfection, uh, embrace scientific thinking, and then, you know, well, uh, assure quality at the source. That to me is about mistake proofing, preventing yes. mistakes. Um, there, there are other guiding principles on the list, but let, let me uh, list with, with regard to this, this, this systems thing that I, you know, where I missed it to me, it was, we didn't focus on the process well enough. Another principle there. Uh, yeah, another principle. Focus, and we didn't focus think, on process. And we did not think systemically. Mm -hmm. We didn't look at the system to say what's missing in the system that, that's failing. Yeah. Uh, and those two just jump out at me on this one is, you know, no, I knew I would, I knew we had done something wrong. You know, I was hopefully humble enough to recognize, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Took me years to figure out what we did wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> but at least you did. But we, but yes, it, it was kind of the, that aha moment that I wanted to share today. Yeah. So yeah, well, and I appreciate you doing that. And you know, these these principles are, you know, so interconnected. So we think about assure we're, we're seeking perfection. We're we're focusing on process. We're assuring quality at the source. But then when something goes wrong, to me, part of respect for respect every individual is we, we we don't blame individuals for systemic problems. Instead of being punitive, we can be helpful. We can connect them into um, the improvement process to prevent, whether it's other mistakes, other causes of harm. Um, it's it's really hard. I mean, these are all so entangled. Um, they are. They're but intertwined. In, a, I mean, in a good way, intertwined. Intertwined. You can't separate them out. If if you don't lead with humility, you don't recognize the the problem that you may have caused. Mm -hmm. And if you don't focus on process, you never discover that there's a problem there in the first place. You know, so yeah, yeah. And I appreciate the focus of you know getting beyond um, tools to 
guiding principles because I, I think tools can be born from principles. Like I think, you know, without some of these principles, um, we wouldn't be driven to use mistake proofing methods because we would just tell people to be careful and we would punish them when they made a mistake. Yeah. But thankfully, you know, we can do better than that. And um, if we didn't have the tool handed to us, I think, you know, um, reflecting on these guiding principles would lead us to create some of these tools that Shigeo Shingo and, and Toyota and others have, have created and shared. So, I mean, we can learn from others, but I think it's stronger yeah. learning. You know, we also have principles. Oh, just, just one personal reflection. You know, I, I started studying Japanese business practices in the late 1970s as mm -hmm. a college student yeah. and, and then joined a Japanese company in 1980. And, I'd learned a lot of the principles just through, for lack of a better word, osmosis, just by living them and doing them and all that. I had never heard them articulated in a way that I could use to teach others. Mm. It, and 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 when the shingle model, the the revision to the shingle model in two thousand eight came out, it was like I, I was just so over. I was like, this is so great mm -hmm. because this this kind of con this is all the things that. I've tried to teach these people all these years and I've never really had a good framework to use to teach them. And finally, here's something that's out there that I can just kind of use this and say, this is the way to do it. Now, that was when I, it was actually the year I transitioned out of industry and joined the university. I wish I'd have had it 20 years earlier yeah. and had access to it and been able to use it to teach people in my organizations you know, what am I trying to explain to you? I'm trying to explain, why do we want to have one piece flow? Well, because, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and stuff like that. You know, I build a one piece flow factory. Well, pretty close to it. Almost perfect, but not quite. <laughs> it still had some things. To, but I build a one, we went, we went from beginning to end in, in 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, to give you an idea of it was, it was a good factory in that yeah. regard. And we had very little inventory. Yeah. And, but I couldn't explain very well why. And I think they got it just through the same osmosis that I learned, but there wasn't a good way to articulate it yeah. and a good way to teach it. It was something they learned over time because we did it. We built it and we did it. And then they got to go, you know, this is better than having all that stacks of inventory that we see in the other factories around here, you know, yeah. Yeah. but it was wonderful to have a new model, a model that we could use to teach with and help people understand with better yeah. What, yeah. what we need to do. So. Yeah, I, I I just think the, very highly of the shingle model. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got a chance, I became an examiner, got involved with the board, then became the executive director and just love the work we do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that shows. And thank you for, for the role that you play and continued evolution and growth of um, the Shingo Institute. Um the, the the guiding principles are a helpful articulation. Because one, one other thing that comes to mind is uh, the, the, the old expression about, um, the goldfish having trouble describing the water that surrounds it in its bowl. I think a lot of people who come up through, I've met a lot of former Toyota people who yes. came up through that system. And there are certain things that are just so, uh, in, in implicit, yes. it can be difficult to really clearly articulate. And I think that's where sometimes the benefit of people like uh, a mutual friend, Steven Spear, Yes. or uh, Jeffrey Liker, or others, or even Norman Bodak to some extent, right? Outside observers who then, from that perspective, can help frame and articulate ideas that are then, you know, uh, more explicit and transferable. I've I've had a chance to interview a bunch of Toyota leaders in Japan. Mm -hmm. And you ask them about, you know, different things Toyota does, and yeah. they just kind of give you like, they don't have... I found that the, the the leaders of Toyota who have had to run operations outside of Japan, mm -hmm. where they have been forced to try to teach this to their mm -hmm. their own workforces, like Bitsu could, mm -hmm. understand much better how to explain what Toyota does. Yeah. The others just lives it. Mm -hmm. They never had to explain it. It's because that's the way everything already was. And yeah. that's the way they learned it was through this kind of osmosis that I learned it through. Mm -hmm. And they are have a difficult time explaining it. The ones who have experience explaining it are much better at explaining. <laughs> incidentally. <laughs> sure, sure. 
get all, and, get, all these, yeah. get all these foreigners in the uh, in my plant and i got to figure out how to explain <laughs> why do we do things that way and they they've learned how to do that yeah <laughs> and I, i'm i'm grateful for that and i know many others yes. are as well so ken i'm i'm grateful for you coming on and, and being a guest and sharing um and and modeling both personally and i think for what the shingo institute has done identifying opportunities for improvement and and leaning into reflection, research, learning, evolution. Um, I appreciate that. And I, I think that sets a great example for others. So thank you. Thank you. I, there's a lot of good left to do in the world through lean. Mm -hmm. I, and I, some of the people I know think lean is dead and I don't think so. It's, it's, no. we're in a, especially as we fin come out of the pandemic, the organizations that were good at this got better. Mm -hmm. And the ones that weren't good at this suffered, and mm -hmm. and it's a t we need to tell that story better, mm -hmm. and and s show the advantages to everybody that this is a better way to run your organization. You can get better ROI, you can get better quality, you can get better worker engagement, you can have a much more fun time with you know, everybody. Can have a more fun time when at their workplace. Yeah, it's just better in so many ways. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's a great note to end on. So again, um, thank you to our guest today, Ken Snyder, Executive Director of the Shingo Institute and Senior Lecturer at Utah State University. Really, really enjoyed it, Ken. Thanks, Mark.